I'm Jason Baer. I'm a professor of philosophy at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. So today in philosophical circles, when philosophers talk about character, they're usually employing a kind of broadly Aristotelian understanding of character, where you can think of your character as the kind of nexus of dispositions that you have to act and think and feel in particular ways, in particular contexts or situations. So for instance, um, when I face uh, fear, um, how do I respond? What do I think? How do I feel? That will say something about whether uh, or the extent to which I might be courageous or cowardly or maybe reckless. Or when it comes to um, a situation in which um, I'm asked to give of my financial resources, um, what do I do? Do I give? How much do I give? How do I feel about giving? Um, so again, our, our character manifests itself in how we act and think and feel from one situation to another. Virtues then would just be strengths or excellences of character. So in the two examples I just mentioned, courage and generosity would be the relevant excellences of character in those situations. Whereas vices would be weaknesses or defects of character. And in the broadly Aristotelian view, um, every virtue has a corresponding vice of excess and a corresponding vice of deficiency. So generosity is a virtue. If you go too far with generosity and are indiscriminate about how you give, um, you can be wasteful with your resources. But if you cling to your resources and don't ever um, give them away to worthy sources, then um, you'd be stingy. So um, in general, I think that's how philosophers talk about and think about character and virtue and vice. Um, but that's just the starting point. So a lot of what we then go on to think about is, well, what exactly is the nature of character? Um, do people actually have character? What's the nature and structure and value of a virtue? What exactly makes something a virtue or what makes something a, a vice? I intellectual virtues, as I think of them, are the character attributes of good thinkers and good learners. Normally when we think about good character, we think of moral qualities or civic qualities. Those are important virtues. Um, but character also manifests in how we think and how we learn and our responsiveness or sensitivity to ends like truth and knowledge and error. Um, and my interest in these traits arose really um, through my acquaintance with the work of Linda Zagzebski, in particular her 1996 book, Virtues of the Mind. Uh, when I came across that, um, I immediately recognized how it brought together some of my interests in epistemology, philosophical study of knowledge, with my interest in ancient Greek ethics and figures like Plato and Aristotle. And so virtue epistemology, which is the, the sort of study of intellectual virtues and their role in knowledge and knowing um, uh, was just kind of immediate. I think also part of what drew me to a study of intellectual virtues is that it provided me with a language and a kind of conceptual repertoire that allowed me to understand what I admired about various people over the course of my life. Um, these were good people that I admired and wanted to be like. But, but I wanted to be like them partly on account of what their attitude or orientation was toward ideas, towards truth, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. And so intellectual virtues um, provide a kind of way of thinking about and conceptualizing that kind of personal goodness or personal excellence. What I enjoy about um, studying, we'll, st we'll start with virtues. What I enjoy about studying virtues is that it's an opportunity to kind of contemplate and better understand a certain kind of goodness, a goodness that's 
important to me that I want to reflect and, and emulate. And if we can drill down on the nature and structure and value of individual virtues, um, we can, uh, in the end, come up with a kind of, again, deeper understanding of what it is to be a good person. And certainly knowing and thinking about what it is to be a good person isn't sufficient for becoming a good person, but it can be helpful in our, in our pursuit of that aim or goal. And then likewise, and in kind of an interesting way, studying vices can also be um, edifying um, in a kind of negative way in the sense that I can, can, can look at the nature, structure, disvalue of a vice and, and be even clearer for myself <laughs> that that's a way that I don't want to be and um, a way that I'd like to try to um, resist and, and, and move away from. To apply that specifically to me, I'll say that the, um, my, my work on and, and time spent exploring humility and pride have been um, painful at times, but, but, but really um, rewarding. Um, and that's because I think there are various interesting ways in which I'm hardwired um, toward um, pride. Not necessarily, or not so much in as far as as far as not so much um, uh, in the form of arrogance, but in terms of kind of a concern for control or perfection or certainty. Right? To me, those are expressions of a certain kind of pride, broadly understood, and it doesn't serve me well as a human being to um, always be striving for certainty or control or perfection. I need to learn to um, be aware of and be comfortable with limitation. And that's true in general. Um, it's also true in the intellectual domain as well. So I need to feel comfortable with what I don't know um, with the limitations of my perspective. And a, a kind of interesting side note on, on um, the notion of pride and its personal application. I'm a big fan of the, of the Southern Gothic writer Flannery O'Connor. And she mainly writes short stories, but her short stories and the couple of novels that she published, um, in my interpretation of work, most of these stories are about characters who are in the grip of pride. And over the course of the narrative, um, their pride is challenged. And, and slowly and painfully and comically, because her work is very, very funny, um, uh, that pride is, is unraveled and the character is humbled. And her characterizations of pride are brilliant. Um, and it's kind of cathartic uh, to see them um, characterized so insightfully and then blown up into these absurd, grotesque characters um, I can laugh at them. <laughs> and it's a painful laughter because I'm also laughing at myself. So in this weird way, um, studying pride in her work has, has been edifying for me because it's helped me um, recognize some of the ways that I um, struggle with, with pride. And it's kind of allowed me to laugh at myself a little bit, which, which, which can help me be more comfortable with my limitations and flaws, uh, which helps bring me to a point of, of humility. So to answer your first question, I think it can be helpful to introduce students to the idea of intellectual character, intellectual virtues, and then to specific virtues like curiosity, open-mindedness, intellectual humility, or intellectual courage, um, partly because it presents us with an opportunity to link those values to the aims and goals that we have for the course. So we all teach for knowledge, we all teach for skills, um, and we all end up doing things that affect, for better or worse, the intellectual character of our students, but we don't often think a lot about that part of what we're doing, let alone um, build objectives related to intellectual character formation into our classes. 
And I think by, by helping students understand that, that a big part of what I want for them is to give them opportunities to better understand their intellectual character and to practice intellectual virtues. Like that's a point or goal of the course. That adds a dimension of meaning and purpose to what they're doing in the classroom because they care about who they are as people. They want to be people that are, that are intellectually courageous or curious or open-minded. And so helping them see that this pursuit of knowledge and skills is also an opportunity to practice and grow in these other qualities can help um, motivate their participation and engagement with the course and add a dimension of meaning and purpose to it. Um, I think also by acquainting students with some of these terms and concepts, um, they can take that knowledge into their lives outside of the classroom and better see and care about opportunities to practice these virtues. Most people have never heard of the idea of intellectual humility, but if I can acquaint my students with what that is and give them some compelling examples of it, model it myself, um, that can be something that they learn about and come to care about and then recognize opportunities to practice in um, their life outside of the classroom. So I think those are some of the benefits of introducing this stuff explicitly to students. Um, when it comes to implementing uh, a concern with intellectual character formation um, from the instructor's standpoint, um, I think you asked about what would my advice be or something like that. And, and one would be, first of all, try to identify some specific virtues that you'd like to help support your students' growth in. And you should think about virtues that are relevant to who your students are, relevant to your subject matter, but maybe coming up with two or three or three or four specific virtues. Again, curiosity, open-mindedness, intellectual courage, intellectual humility, intellectual autonomy, carefulness, thoroughness, perseverance, take your pick. Um, but by identifying a limited number of specific virtues, um, you can kind of uh, use that as a starting point and then begin to ask yourself questions like, well, um, how, do I model these virtues for my students and how do I do that? How could I better or more authentically um, model these virtues for my students? And then also think about um, how am I already creating opportunities for my students to practice these virtues? So in the case of curiosity, in what ways or when do I give my students opportunities to wonder or to ask thoughtful questions? Or with open-mindedness, how often and in what assignments or in what ways am I giving them opportunities to explore alternative perspectives? And I think most of us will see that in many ways this is something we're already doing but also something that we can do better and do more of. And, and so if you start with a specific focus, a limited number of virtues, make sure you have a good grip on what those virtues do and don't involve, and then thinking about how am I and how can I model those for my students, and then how can I give them opportunities to practice those virtues, and then also um, can, how can I provide them with meaningful feedback and support and affirmation in their practice of those virtues. I'd say that's a pretty good start. Part of what it is to be a good community member or to be a good citizen is to think well. Um, democratic participation, democratic deliberation needs to be um, informed by good thinking um, and by the, an appropriate sort of pursuit and refinement of knowledge and information. Um, but of course, with all the, the, the misinformation that there is in the world, it can be hard to satisfy those demands of, of, of democratic citizenship. Um, it can be um, difficult to know what information to trust or not to trust, what sources to trust or to mistrust. Um, 
and because of the way that we can kind of procure our own intake of information or because of the way that that gets done for us by uh, search engines or social media, uh, we can end up finding ourselves insulated intellectually, cognitively, epistemically, informationally from people that are different from us. And uh, while I don't think the practice of intellectual virtues is a complete or total solution to some of these issues, I think it's an important part of a solution. So when it comes to information gathering, I need to be appropriately um, skeptical. I need to be appropriately um, cautious. I need to be aware of what I don't know. I need to be aware of who the relevant experts are and, rel and, and prepared to trust those, those experts. Um, so if we can help our students grow in qualities like curiosity, open-mindedness, and intellectual humility, or just give them opportunities to practice those virtues in class, in connection with our subject matter. The hope is that they can then take those, those habits of mind into their engagement with ideas and information outside of the classroom and be appropriately skeptical and careful, but also open and intellectually humble and, and the like. Um, and then similarly, um, it's so easy now to vilify people who think differently than, than, than we do. And I think often that, that, that instinct toward vilification is rooted in fear. Uh, fear of difference, fear of loss, fear of change. But then the way that fear manifests is in how we think about our intellectual enemy or opponent or other. And it's striking to me that when we vilify um, our, our, our ideological other, um, uh, how simplistic and often crude and unnuanced and inflexible our thinking is about that other. And when you really step back and think about it, it's like it couldn't be that simple, right? They, they, they couldn't be that dumb, right? Or they couldn't be that malicious, realistically. So how can we think in a more nuanced, charitable, careful, fair, and honest way about people who disagree with us? That's a big challenge. And I think that if, again, we can, we can help students, help ourselves to, to practice some of these virtues of the mind, um, it can make a big difference when it comes to public discourse and again the kind of um, democracy and political and shared life together that that supports.